Greetings from Tokyo. My name is Daisuke Beppu, and I hope all of you are doing very well today. Now, I must beg your pardon, but if you don't mind, I would like to share with you five by criterion. So this is a series that I'd like to start here, which is based off of the sort of 10 favorite uh, criterion titles and 10 more favorite criterion titles and, and top 10 criterions, etc. I think these videos are really helpful because they help, at least when I see them by other YouTubers, for example. I am very encouraged because I can see what other people are uh, interested in and the kinds of films that they recommend from the Criterion Collection. And since the Criterion Collection is very vast, you know, comprised of over 900 titles by spine number, uh, those sorts of varying points of view uh, can be very helpful for someone like me. Uh, so what I thought might be interesting would be to provide a set of videos that showcase five titles that uh, I think are worthy of note and mention and hopefully worthy of your attention uh, by you getting the Blu-ray or DVD or watching it on Filmstruck if it's available or through other labels if they're released that way because I think they really deserve to be um, to be uh, watched and I think they deserve a lot of attention and Criterion obviously is a label that provides a lot of attention to films that sometimes are not uh, seen as much as they should uh, so that is one of the great uh, services that Criterion performs for the cinephile and film-loving community. So as part of that, I just wanted to show uh, five titles uh, from this uh, Criterion collection that I thought were really worthwhile. And hopefully I can turn this into maybe just a, a regular thing and just show five uh, titles from Criterion uh, in sort of a, a collection uh, video like this. And I won't spoil anything, and I'll just try to be as uh, as quick as possible with my descriptions. Uh, but uh, I understand that some of these films have not been seen, or maybe you haven't seen any of them yet. So I don't want to give you. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what happens at the end in these little blurbs. So don't worry about that. Uh, but if you have any questions or concerns or um, anything you want to ask further, please let me know at any time. With that out of the way, and without further ado, let us begin with Five by Criterion. Spy number 678, La Notte. This is the film directed by Michelangelo Antonioni, uh, 1961. Now, a viewer of one of my videos, uh, my video regarding the Eureka Masters of Cinema collection that I have, uh, suggested that I discuss this film. Uh, so Paul, ex please excuse me if I pronounce your name incorrectly. I apologize if I do. Um, but Paul uh, Beauparlant? Paul Beauparlant? I think I got that right. I hope so. If not, please forgive me. Let me know if I was mistaken. But Paul, you had asked about La Notte and my thoughts about it. So I'm sorry I'm not doing it in the context of Masters of Cinema, but uh, let me just speak uh, to the film in terms of the film itself rather than the features on the Criterion or the Masters of Cinema, if you don't mind. Um, maybe I will address the Masters of Cinema release in a separate video. 
uh, in, in just very briefly, I do think that the Master of Cinema release is a little bit, uh, a little bit better than the Criterion Collection. S sorry, Criterion fans, but I think there are some aspects of that release that I think are a little bit, uh, a little bit better uh, than this. Not by much though, because they are both uh, very good releases. So this is the Criterion release of La Note, and gosh. I don't know. I, I think this film works better if you've been in a relationship or if you've been married or you are married or you were married uh, because it's a film about a couple, a man and a woman, Lydia and Giovanni. Uh, Lydia played by the beautiful John Moreau and Giovanni played by Marcello Mastriani. Uh, and you just see them through the course of uh, a day. It's not a full day, I don't think, because we see them maybe uh, in the middle of the day or maybe sometime, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's the middle of the day. I don't, it's still daytime, and they make a very important visit to an acquaintance of theirs, a very close friend, actually, in the hospital. And after that visit, we see the two of them uh, Lydia and Giovanni make certain encounters with other characters, get into certain situations um, which might seem to be a little bit trivial and not important, but when you step back and you think about it, they are probably very significant in the context of the story that is being told in the film La Notte. And the day progresses to night where we have a great set piece involving a house party. What to say about this film? It's it's really, um, oh gosh, what I don't know. It, it's it's sort of a, 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 it's one of those films where I don't want. Uh, it's one of those films where I think you really have to see it many times uh, in order to let it soak in and sink into your pores. And I know that sounds a bit pretentious, and I don't mean. To sound pretentious when I say, "Oh, you should see it more than once." You can't understand it if you just see it once. But really, I think it is very uh, vague, and it is very, uh, uh, very well. It's not so forthcoming with its details about the specifics that involve you know, with these characters. You know, we don't get the backgrounds of um, the, the characters of Lydia and Giovanni, so it's all. Um, uh, implied in the imagery or in the way that the characters interact or react to certain situations. So therefore, um, yes, it helps to watch this film more than once. And gosh, the way the characters interact in this film is amazing to me because, you know, sometimes, well, yeah, most of the time when you watch a film, right, uh, any film, you always are marveled at the way that the characters connect and the way they um, they seem to work together or they find a connection uh, on a human level, an emotional level or physical level. Uh, it's And it just becomes something that's very captivating as a viewer, as an audience member when you watch that sort of film. Here is kind of the opposite, right? Because you're talking about two characters and they're not connecting. The more It's fascinating because you see them not connecting. I mean, they're just off, right? One character is, is on one trajectory, and another char the other character is just on a completely different trajectory. You know, they just miss each other. And it's so fascinating to see these uh, encounters between this, this um, you know, Lydia and Giovanni. It's just amazing where they're talking together and they're having a conversation, but you can see that one person is thinking one thing and the other person is just on a completely different wavelength. They are not connecting at all. And that is fascinating because it is showing you within the context of something that is simple uh, drama, uh, the way that a dramatic scene you know, um, uh, develops between two characters um, uh, you know, written within the context of a film. It's amazing how you have a simple setup between a, a, you know, one character and another conversing and you realize that they are not connecting at all. And then that is the whole point because you're seeing either this breakdown or this 
this relationship where there there seems to be something fundamentally wrong emotionally you can sense it and therefore just to see that played out and represented in this way that the characters converse with each other is fascinating you know there's a great scene um, without going into too much detail where they're in a jazz bar and you could see just the, the performances you know Jean Moreau has a look on her face where she's trying to connect with um, uh, Giovanni the Marcello Mastriani character but he is just thinking about something completely different or he's something else is uh, 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 preoccupying his mind and his thoughts and then he turns and he tries to uh, give her the attention that she wants but she's already thinking about something else and the conversation just weaves back and forth in this way that is frustrating and fascinating at the same time and that's just an example there are so many examples where this happens throughout the film and gosh it is truly fascinating to see the way in which characters don't connect <laughs> in a film and it's amazing it's amazing there's a wonderful shot you have um, you, you know people uh, you know a character sitting down at a table and just looking at an empty chair that's right in front of that character or you have the way that things are edited uh, things are edited in a way that that cuts off certain characters and and, and creates a sense of isolation uh, emotional isolation you know a character is alone and loneliness occupies the whole the whole scene and then you you bring into that the wonderful addition of um, uh, the Monica Vitti character uh, so she uh, really just a, a youthful character but filled with a sense of intelligence and um, is just well grounded and seems to know uh, what's going on at least more so than the the seemingly older couple of Lydia and Giovanni really just a fascinating mixture um, and Oh gosh, I didn't even go into the, the, the setting and the architecture and the way that architecture is used. It's, it's amazing. It's, you know, there's a lot, there's some really great uh, discussions on this disc about the, the use of architecture in uh, Antonioni's films, uh, but in La Notte in particular. And um, some, I admit it's, I'm, I'm really fascinated by that discussion, but I admit sometimes it goes over my head because I'm not so smart to catch all of it. But if I were to explain it in terms that I could understand, it would be something like, you know how you go, let's say, to um, uh, you, you, you go and see a, a beautiful view of um, the of a city, a nighttime city, and it's nighttime and you see the lights blink and flash, and maybe you're you're looking at it from afar, you know, and you think to yourself gosh it's so beautiful but then you also think at the same time gosh I feel so alone you know it's a nighttime view of a, of a city skyline and you can't see anyone it's beautiful and lonely at the same time and that's what I think uh, this film is and the way architecture is used it's beautiful and lonely at the same time which is why this is such a fascinating and lovely and just uh, uh, gosh, just this kind of soul-crushing film, uh, especially if you're married or in a relationship. Man, man, this is just just something else. Anyway, La Notte uh, by Michelangelo Antonioni. Fantastic film. Spine number 267, Kagemusha, 1980. Uh, this is directed by um, Mr. Akira Kurosawa. So this is a 1980 film which means that um, it is a color film from Akira Kurosawa and it is a historical epic film. It is a film which relies on historical details uh, that are true to fact, or at least uh, they are based on uh, uh, true historical details with respect to the um, uh, you know Japanese history and the uh, the war, the rivalry that occurred between uh, the great um, sort of uh, warlords. Um, uh, you have uh, Oda Nobunaga and um, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, and you have Takeda Shingen. And you have two of them forming a sort of alliance against Shingen. And so that's the whole crux of the 
of the story, which is this historical context. Uh, the war between these sort of three sides, or kind of two sides, uh, but your main focus is with uh, Takeda Shingen. And so therefore, that is the historical backdrop of Kagemusha. But, gosh, what can I say? It probably will help you to know the general historical background of the film. And I think, yes, I, actually the more I think about it, the more I think that is true. It will help you because there are a lot of characters here and a lot of characters that uh, kind of come in and come out and you're, maybe one is expected to know them. Uh, you get a sense that Kurosawa made the film uh, expecting that uh, his audience would know these characters. So perhaps it might be, uh, you know, I might make the, the, the gentle recommendation if you watch this film, just beforehand, just try to look up some details, even if it's just a, a couple, you know. Uh, in this day and age of uh, Wikipedia and the like, I'm sure at the very least there might be some details there. Uh, of course, the deeper that you want to go uh, into the, the historical study, you know, more power to you. Um, but that's just the historical stuff aside. Uh, if as a film and as a as a sort of visceral experience, um, I mean, there's a reason why Kurosawa is considered one of the great masters of cinema, and that is because of films like this. Um, he takes a film that is so complicated and complex with its historical intricacies and its um, uh, sort of uh, military and political uh, intrigue, which is very complex uh, and. At the same time, he presents a very human story on its front. And it's a human story, basically, it's just about a man who's trying to be better than what he is. That's all. And what a, what a, uh, at this, you know, on the one hand, it's a very heartwarming tale. And on the other hand, it's very tragic. Because, um, well, let me just stop there. <sighs> If you have not seen this yet, uh, it is highly recommended because it is at once warm and cold. It is both um, uh, funny and sad. It is just endearing and frustrating. It has the most, you know, among the most love, you know, just beautiful set pieces, uh, wonderful uses of color. Um, it's a real intriguing way to depict violence, um, and it's uh, certainly uh, a very artistic and poetic way to present violence and war. At the center of it, of course, you have the great performance by the great, great actor, Mr. Tatsuya Nakadai, uh, who plays uh, two roles. And this is revealed at the very beginning of the film, the very opening shot of the film. We realize we have two roles played by the same actor within the same frame. And it's amazing to behold because he establishes a balance between these two separate characters. It's uncanny, but it's amazing. And I suppose I, I, I shouldn't be surprised because it is the great Tatsuya Nakadai, but I'm surprised every time I see it just how distinct those two characters are. Yes, this is uh, one of my favorite films by Kurosawa. And the Blu-ray from Criterion is quite amazing. It has a wonderful uh, commentary by Mr. Stephen Prince, you know, the very uh, learned Kurosawa scholar. And I really love his work. Stephen Prince's work is really nice and well presented. Yeah, this is really great. This is really great. It's not... It's it. There's a lot of violence implied, but it's not shown on screen in a way that's graphic and uh, potentially off-putting. Uh, so it, it's something that I think can be quote-unquote family-friendly, as it were, but it is still an intense film. And uh, it's intense uh, because of its war scenes, but it's also intense because of the human drama that unfolds. It's just so, oh man, Again, without spoiling it, just, just some of the way that the story unfolds. You know, you have the just, oh man, just dire consequences, just huge dramatic uh, events that occur because of single, minute 
mistakes or or just little little things that turn into big things it's just ah uh, i think about it now and 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 <laughs> i almost want to cry because uh, it's just so it's so uh as a film as drama it's wonderful but on a human level it's so sad it's so sad it breaks my heart um and uh it the, the way that it can break one's heart and just um at the same time make one feel uh maybe both uh, sad and triumphant it's a real amazing film it's amazing film kagemusha by kurosawa if you haven't seen it please please do yourself a favor and uh try to find it and watch it it's real lovely spy number 89 sisters by uh, Mr. Brian De Palma. Hello. This is just a quick note. After I had filmed the video and that I was currently editing, the Criterion Collection released uh, news about the releases that were planned for October 2018. And lo and behold, among those planned releases is a new upgrade release of Brian De Palma's Sisters, which is really wonderful news. I cannot begin to tell you enough just how excited this makes me. I am so thrilled and I, am so, I just cannot wait for October. This is turning out to be a really splendid year for Criterion releases, 2018. There are so many great releases uh, on the slate planned and among them is certainly Sisters. This means, however, that the DVD that I was showing in this video is probably going to be um, a bit out of date very soon. And so if you're watching this before October 2018, I suggest strongly that you do not get the DVD, but that you wait until you get until the Blu-ray comes out. Um, of course, if you are a collector of Criterion and you are interested in collecting all versions of a single title, then of course, by all means, please go ahead and get the old DVD you know, with the orange cover. That's perfectly fine. But if you are just interested in getting the best possible version, then I'd wait until after October 2018 and just get the new release. Uh, the Blu-ray release, which I also think is going to be on a new DVD as well. If you have any questions or uh, if you're not sure about anything, just check out the Criterion Collection website and check out the, the coming soon section in which uh, you'll be sure to find a little uh, information about the new release of Sisters. Anyway, thank you very much and please enjoy the rest of this video. Spy number 89, Sisters, by uh, Mr. Brian De Palma, 1973. This is an old DVD. It's old, obviously, because of the spine number, which is 89. So perhaps it's possible to find this film, and not perhaps, I know it is possible to find this film uh, on other labels, on Blu-rays that are released by um, other labels. And I think probably in terms of quality of presentation and wealth of uh, supplemental material, etc., I think those releases are probably the best way to go. Uh, this is probably not the one that you want to turn to immediately as far as a release of this film is concerned. But if you are a Criterion collector, of course, this is the way to go. And let me just talk about the film itself for the next few minutes, if, if I may, because I think it is a really, mm, how shall I put it? Um, it is a fun, shocking, hilarious uh, surprising thriller. It's fun. It is really fun and scary and violent. Once again, if you are not into violent films, this film is not for you because it is a, it's quite a scary film actually. But if you don't mind violence and you don't mind 
uh, sort of jumping out of your seat at a, <laughs> a sudden scare, then please check this out if you haven't seen it. The story is about, uh, ooh, I'll stop there because that's one of the great things about this film is not knowing what it's about going in. So if you haven't seen it yet, I urge you not to read about it. Uh, don't read any any plot synopses or don't look it up uh, look it up on Wikipedia. Just watch it. Again, be warned because it is intense. It has certain scenes that are pretty ugh, pretty icky. But if you can get through those, this is a real fascinating watch. Um, Brian De Palma, of course, is a very famous filmmaker, and he's known uh, at least. Uh, partially for his admiration of uh, the filmmaker Alfred Hitchcock and he relies a lot on Hitchcock's uh, tricks and uh, technique in order to create De Palma's own suspense films and thriller films and so some people might say oh Brian De Palma uh, pays too much homage or he copies Hitchcock etc but you must understand that Brian De Palma is his own filmmaker and this is his film and there are certainly a number of flourishes visual techniques that Brian De Palma uses in this film that have never been used in any Hitchcock film before and so yes this is a wholly Brian De Palma effort and uh, it is great because of it What's great about De Palma is he doesn't use the camera superfluously. Right? In other words, he doesn't use it just for the sake of showing off. He uses it for a dramatic reason. And every time you see a little trick of the camera, whether it's a certain slow motion flourish or a split screen or any other kind of um, uh, maybe point of view shot, um, uh, odd uses of focus, etc. It's always for a purpose. It always is used to heighten the suspense, uh, stretch out the tension, or somehow augment or help add to uh, characterizations that are being created. I mean, it, it's it's the perfect example. This is the perfect example of, of the way he builds character. You know, for example, the, um, the, the, the reporter character played by Jennifer Salt. You know, there's a way that um, you know, we are introduced to her character quite abruptly and very quickly in this film, but De Palma uses the camera work in such a way that we know all about this character in the space of just a few seconds, and that's due to how De Palma uses his camera. It's the perfect example of that great adage of show, not tell. This is all about show, not tell, and it's a marvel of a film because of it. Uh, this film is great because of Brian De Palma and his stamp, and he just puts a stamp on every bit of the frame, and you can feel it. <sighs> Again, you get that part of this, uh, the you get that part of this marvel of the film combined with the suspenseful, scary parts. And boom, it comes together in a, in a film that should be lauded and loved by film, uh, film lovers and cineasts alike. Again, sisters. If you are watching this video by me, chances are you've probably already seen this film. Uh, but on the off chance that you haven't, please, for your consideration, sisters. Again, if you don't mind scary films, this film is highly recommended. Spine number 89. This is a DVD, but if you can find it elsewhere, again, I encourage you to do so. It's a great film. Really great film. This is spine number 926. Manila in the Claws of Light. Lino Bracca is the name of the filmmaker. Now, this is a film from the Philippines and released in 1975. When I got this film, I mean, I got this film because it was in the Criterion Collection, and the Criterion Collection is something that I'm very much into, and I buy all the films on the Criterion Collection, no matter what. And this was no exception, but I had never seen it before until uh, it came in the Criterion Collection, and I didn't know much about it, but... Those are some of the great things. That's some of the great surprises uh, in the Criterion Collection, is it not? Because 
when you watch a film and you don't know anything about it and you are if it's just all the more potential for that film to blow you away and this film blew me away it left me stunned I was numb when it was over it has certain flourishes which I still am just startled by I'm, I'm shocked to the core and I mean that in the most complimentary way I can because this is a fascinating uh, social commentary film infused with tragedy and um, just a, a bravura uh, a real sense of purpose and um, uh, cinematic uh, ingenuity uh, which is a real it's combined in a way that is just so uh, so shocking and stunning I mean I guess I'd probably say it's very much uh, has the same flavor and the same attitude and um, just raw power as a film like Taxi Driver by Martin Scorsese this feels like that and it just has a certain I just love its purpose because it you know that it, it's driven in a way that is not random but it has a certain sense of purpose and and philosophy and it has a vision which is uh, which cannot be denied uh, the filmmaker Lino Bracca Lino Bracca is the filmmaker I want you to remember this this is very very important and uh, the just gosh gosh this is a this is just a, a fantastic film. I cannot recommend this enough. Um, oh gosh, if you can get this, uh, you know, buy this on Blu-ray, just go out and buy it and watch it immediately. Um, if you can watch it on streaming, just watch it on streaming because it will just just floor you. And I don't want to say anything. I'm not going to spoil it, but I'm just going to say this. Just one of the most poetically astounding finishes to a film I have seen in a long time in a long time uh, just special kudos to uh, uh, Mr. Rafael Rocco Jr. and to Ms. Uh, Hilda uh, Coronel really just two fine superb performances in what is a superb masterful film Manila in the Claws of Light, please, I urge you, please, uh, you know, for your consideration, please, uh, if you're so inclined, just give this one a try. I promise you, uh, you won't be disappointed. Manila in the Claws of Light, please, please, uh, um, uh, you know, I want to champion this film more. I can't, again, I can't stress enough how much I really enjoyed this film and was just floored by this film. Anyway, Manila in the Claws of Light, spy number 926. So, 217, Tokyo Story. This is a film that is... I don't even know if I should talk about this film because um, I feel so... Um, intellectually just ill-equipped to be able to talk about this film in a way that will do the film at least some semblance of justice. Um, let me just give it a try, but if I fail miserably, please accept my apologies. Um, again, 1953. This is directed by a gentleman by the name of Mr. Yasujiro Ozu. And it tells a very uh, well it's it seems simple but that's deceptive because it is very complicated it's a complicated film about family dynamics and what I mean by that is the dynamics that exist between uh, parents and their children and their children being grown up and what makes it even more complicated is that it is set in the context of the immediate um, uh, post-war period uh, of Japan. So the, the period uh, that uh, came immediately after the end of World War II. And so, excuse me, 
and I think this is a film that relies heavily on the context of you know, the post-war period, um, although it doesn't make direct reference to that. Uh, well, it does in a way, but uh, it's not really the main part of the story. The main part of the story is basically about the 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 uh, the uh, father and the mother, you know, the the couple, uh, the elderly couple, uh, Chishiryu and Chiyoko Higashiyama, and they are visiting their grown-up children who are in Tokyo. Hence the title Tokyo Story, uh, Tokyo Monogatari. Just the way that we see the family interact with each other the way that the grown-up children treat their parents, the way that the grown-up children talk to each other about their parents, and the way that uh, we have people trying to just live their lives in, in just a manner that is so understandable and relatable and so down-to-earth, and yet at the same time so cruel and so thoughtless of others um, which is the real brilliance of this film you know it, it's it's that one of those films where you don't have any true heroes and villains you know for example the 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 daughter the grown-up daughter um, who's played by Haruko Sugimura and her character's name is Shige uh, she's probably the the most um, yeah, I would say that I hate her character the most of these characters. And what I mean by that is I find her character to be very uh, selfish and very um, uh, just uh, not caring about the parents at all. But no, that is not the case, really. If you think about it, you know, Shige is a real human character and a full fully developed one you know she seems selfish and perhaps to some extent she actually is selfish but you know that she loves the parents um, maybe there's a bit of a complicated relationship between her and for example her mother uh, but you know that there is love there and you can sense it especially what the way that her shige reacts uh, when certain events occur uh, in around the middle of the film so she, it's just a real fascinating way that uh, this film treats its characters. It treats them in, in a way that is very full and rounded, well-rounded. Uh, we hate them and we love them at the same time, if that makes any sense. And isn't that the, the best way to reflect uh, uh, you know the the wide scope of uh, you know the human character. I mean, the human character is a complicated thing, is it not? So therefore, it should be both light and dark, and everything in between, likable and not likable. The traits that drive us crazy and the traits that we admire and respect. It should all come together into one single package of a human being, which is full and filled with life. And that's exactly what the example I gave Shige is. She's uh, full and rich and filled with life. And that's what this film is, really. It's just, it's filled with um, life and it's filled with disappointment. Gosh, oh gosh, is it filled with disappointment. I mean, the, the amount of disappointment in this, you will be crying, I, I swear. You will be crying by the end of this film. Uh, but the way that it just moves you and it just flows through you in a way that is, um, what should I say? It, it is uh, transformative. Yes, transformative. <sighs> Chichiryu and Chiyoko Higashiyama as the, the couple. Um, f amongst the finest performances uh, ever. Ever. Um, and Chichiryu especially. Especially just, uh, you know, this has to be he has to be uh, on the list of uh, you know the greatest actor of all time he just has to be on that list because he is he has to be one of the greatest actors of all time if not the greatest actor of all time it's amazing uh, what he achieves in this film the way that little little twitches and little um, his the way that his eyes register I mean his eyes can you believe it he used he, his soul Everything is through his eyes, and he, it. Every time he speaks, it's very muted and very um, 
uh, not non-aggressive. There are some points when he's aggressive, but uh, it's very muted and very uh, subdued. Yes, at least his speech is. But that's that's the great thing because you just look at his face and you look at his his posture and you realize that there is so much more going on within his mind and his heart than meets the eye. <sighs> he is one of the greats, isn't he? And uh, she's not pictured here. Uh, well, she's pictured on the older DVD. Setsuko Hara, of course. The beautiful, lovely Setsuko Hara. The just... Here she is. Let me just show a picture of her from the booklet of the Blu-ray. Setsuko Hara. Just... What can I say about her performance here except it's just... It's a miracle. Uh... It's a miracle. Anyone who says anything less uh, doesn't know what, what uh, he or she is talking about. It, it's a true miracle. Uh, and uh, just the way that certain interactions between certain characters occurs in this film and the, the events that unfold, uh, there are quite a few surprises, uh, many surprises, I would say. And just how these characters deal with that, uh, that sense of surprise and, and suddenness, uh, each character deals with it in a slightly different way. And uh, isn't that true of all families? Huh? You know, each person in a family tr deals with certain events in his or her own way. Uh, and so in that sense, it's so real and relatable. And on the other hand, it is so transformative and um, it's just uh, a real... Oh, gosh, how, what, what, what words can I use to describe it? Oh, it's like... It's like, ah, oh, man, you know when you've cried, and you know that feeling when you've cried so much you can't cry anymore, and you're just exhausted after crying your 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 eyes out. It's that moment of exhaustion. It's it's that sort of moment of exhaustion, that pure, just human moment when you are just it's just you and your feelings and your soul. That's what. That's what it's like when you watch this film, Tokyo Story. Oh gosh, that's a terrible way of explaining it, is it? I apologize. My my expressions are really terrible. Ugh. But um, anyway, uh, if you haven't seen this, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's stopping you, but uh, you really should do yourself a big favor and get this film and watch it immediately. Your life will change. I promise you. Um, this is a a yeah, potentially life changing film, um, and it is a film from post war Japan. But it is so immediate and relatable, which is why it will affect you. And I know it will affect you. And if you do see it for the first time, and you are willing to share with me and the rest of us how you felt about it, uh, please, by all means, let me know. Um, I, I really would love to know uh, people's reactions to this film if they're seeing it for the first time. It is, um, it is not uh, any, um, uh, yeah, it is not any undeserved exaggeration. Uh, when I say that it is a true miracle of cinema. Tokyo Story is a miracle of cinema. And so you deserve to, yeah, I mean, you, you should treat yourself to this miracle of cinema if you haven't already. Please, please, I, I implore you, please watch Tokyo Story. You will not regret it. Spine number 217. This is the uh, dual format edition, actually. And I love it so much, I got two of them. <laughs> and I also have the, the Criterion DVD. I love this film so much. It's a real lovely film. Anyway, Tokyo Story. Again, I apologize for uh, my, my comments because I, I think about what I've just said and I realize that I really didn't do this film justice. It really deserves, it deserves a 10-hour YouTube <laughs> whatever, video series. I, I don't even think that's enough. I think it's just maybe 100 hours Tokyo Story. Anyway, thank you very much. So that concludes my five by Criterion. Um, hopefully this will be one of many episodes, as it were. But the films that I covered today are Tokyo Story, Kagemusha, 
sisters, La Notte, and Manila in the Claws of Light. If you haven't seen any of these films, please, uh, yes, it would be so wonderful for you to go out and see them, at least uh, one of them, and just letting me know what you think. Um, even if you watch it and you think, huh, it's not for me, I don't like it, that's fine. Uh, I would love to hear those thoughts too. Uh, you don't have to love the films uh, the way I love them. I mean, you can hate the films, and that's perfectly fine with me. I won't be offended. On the contrary, I would love to hear those comments because I think um, any reaction to the films is perfectly legitimate. So, um, uh, And that would help me to reevaluate and reassess my own views and isn't that what uh, what I mean, that's what's so great about cinemas is just we should uh, we can talk about it and exchange our viewpoints and uh, disagree and not have to argue but just try to uh, help each other um, uh, think and rethink and reevaluate and that's certainly what I'm asking uh, and what a lot of people uh, have been doing for me is you've been helping me to reassess and reevaluate and just explore and discover and gosh you know uh, uh, that's just the best thing isn't it really anyway uh, thank you very much for your time and your patience and I know you're busy so uh, even if you watch just a little bit of this video you know I'm so appreciative really thank you so much it means so much to me <sighs> yes so uh, hopefully this will be one of a series of videos five by criterion my name is Daisuke Beppu uh, thank you for watching cheers